So today our guest is Laura Manchinska from the University of Copenhagen. So maybe before we start, I, I, I will say a few words about her. So Laura obtained her PhD in 2013 from the University of Waterloo. Then she held two postdoctoral positions, uh, one uh, in, at CQT in Singapore with uh, Stefani Weiner and the second one uh, at the University of Bristol with uh, Ashley Montanaro. So these are, uh, I guess, one of the best places for quantum information. And since 2017, she's at the University of Copenhagen. And uh, her interests are recently centered around uh, quantum the problem of quantum certification, in particular self-testing. So, and today she will tell us about self-testing, I guess, no? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Ramek, for the very nice uh, introduction. Um, it's, it's great to talk to you guys. Um, and actually, as I mentioned, I think this is my first time giving a talk in Poland, so I'm excited. Um, and even though right now I'm in Copenhagen, I originally come from Latvia, which is almost neighbors uh, Poland. And as you can guess, maybe from my surname, I have some Polish ancestry. Uh, unfortunately, I don't speak any Polish, um, but uh, my grandpa, uh, my, my grandpa's family was from Poland and that's where my surname uh, comes from. Um, yeah, and when it comes to quantum information, I'm kind of interested in various different topics, um, but uh, one particular focus is entanglement. And on one hand, on sort of kind of theoretical understanding of entanglement, but then also how we can use quantum entanglement as a resource to do something that we couldn't do with conventional technologies. But uh, recently I've been working, I've become interested in this topic of self-testing or certification of quantum devices, as Remick mentioned. And, and this is what I will uh, speak about to you today. And please feel free to interrupt me at any point with questions. I'd rather you do that than wait till the end and then lose some of you um, in the middle of it. Okay. So, I want to start with kind of giving you some general idea of what this self-testing is because it's a slightly tricky concept. Uh, so I will start with kind of the philosophy behind it. And if you want during this talk, you can think that self-testing means certification process of proper functioning of quantum devices. And we're in this certification, uh, we are aiming to make only minimal assumptions, okay? So this minimal assumption is kind of the uh, feature, the kind of feature that comes with these self-testing certification protocols. All right, so now the basic uh, question kind of is, well, we know that nowadays we have more and more of these real world quantum devices become available. And usually when you procure such a device, it comes together with certain claims of what it's supposed to be doing. So now the question somehow is, um, and this could be more or less important depending on the specific application where you're want to use your quantum devices is how do you actually know that this device is doing what it claims to be doing? And for instance, also it's not doing something extra. For instance, like if you're using to generate some random key that it's not like um, uh, that this key is not available to some third party or so on. Right? Okay, so, so now this, this setup is gonna be like this. We have a quantum device and we would want to know that how do we know that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing? And two functionalities that I'm gonna be trying to certify or verify are, are these two basic quantum things we could do. And the first one is generation of quantum states. So here you can think that this device would be a box where you press a button and then out should come a specific quantum state. Okay, and I'll think of quantum state as being described by some complex unit vector. Okay, so some vector in C to the D. And then the second functionality is that of a quantum measurement. So this is a box where you can put in an unknown quantum state and out will come a classical label. Okay? In the simplest case, just zero or one. So uh, one way to specify such a thing would be using this POVM formalism, right? So in the case of two outcomes, I would have two positive sum indefinite operators, these E0 and E1 that add up to identity. All right, 
so now we have these boxes and we and someone claims of what quantum state they're supposed to generate and what measurement they're uh, supposed to uh, perform. Now self-testing would be a verification that these boxes really do these claim tasks in the setting where we don't have any trusted quantum devices, okay? So may maybe let's think about the opposite situation where we would have some trusted quantum devices, okay? And I wanna say that in that setting, this task is easy, right? If you have trusted um, state generation boxes, you can use these trusted boxes to test an untrusted or uncharacterized measurement device, right? By simply putting these now known states into this measurement box and seeing that you're getting the right statistics out. And also the other way around, right? If you had trusted uh, quantum measurements, you could perform tomography uh, to kind of certify proper functioning of these state generation devices. But in this setting of self-testing, we're kind of stuck in this chicken egg problem almost, right? Where we don't have trusted uh, state generation, we don't have trusted uh, quantum measurements. So how do, we, how do we get both out of nothing seemingly? Okay, and um, so this um, the self-testing has recently really gained popularity and there are a lot of people doing, um, doing working on this. And uh, I just want to caution you not to take my talk as some sort of survey. It's not, I could not accomplish that within uh, this time. Uh, so yeah, you can um, check out uh, this uh, review, uh, relatively recent review if you want kind of a more co comprehensive account of what's known in this setting. Okay, but how do we accomplish this certification task in the setting with no trusted quantum devices? Okay, and how, how come it's possible at all? So the idea is kind of that rather than just trying to certify one single device, like one single state generation or measurement device, we're gonna take a bunch of them. We're gonna take some state generation device and some measurement devices and kind of try to cross check their answers against one another. You could think that this is somewhat analogous to how you might try to prevent two suspects from lying uh, to you if you interrogate them in separate rooms, okay? That's what we're gonna do. But it's gonna take several of these devices uh, and we're gonna put them far apart and perform these measurements and then cross check their answers. And in the context of self-testing, I said that we aim to make minimal assumptions, but yet there are some assumptions. The first one is that quantum mechanics is correct. So we're by no means trying to kind of verify that quantum theory is correct. We're not in that realm. And another assumption is that we have some means of enforcing this no communication requirement. Um, that's why I drew this wall between Alice and Bob or between these devices uh, within a certain time period. We could imagine that we can implement uh, this no communication requirement by placing these devices sufficiently far apart. All right, so then what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna perf uh, perform, uh, we're gonna randomly select what measurements we're gonna perform. And these measurements are just indexed by some uh, labels, classical labels X on one side and what measurements to perform on the other side. And then we're gonna collect, uh, apply these measurements to the shared state that we are now looking to certify. Uh, and we're gonna collect uh, the uh, statistics about what outcomes we get. So the outcomes are this little a and little b. So we're first gonna estimate uh, these probabilities. So what's the probability that upon performing measurements x on Alice, measurement x on Alice and y on Bob, we get outcomes A and B respectively, okay? So some, this is often called a correlation, this collection of these probabilities. And then uh, a generic informal self-testing statement would say that, well, essentially there is just one way to produce these probabilities P. And this is by performing specific measurements, some given by these A's on Alice and B's on Bob, on some specific bipartite quantum state psi. So here, what we are certifying is this bipartite state psi together with these measurements. Uh, so some collection of measurements on Alice and collection of measurements on Bob. 
And then, so notice that I'm actually certifying bipartite states here. Uh, you could also uh, have uh, similarly tried to certify multipartite states, but you have to have um, uh, some, some kind of uh, uh, composite system, right? So that you can, you can pull it apart and enforce this no communication and then cross check against uh, one another. Uh, so maybe another thing to note here is that what we're doing is we have, uh, we are interacting with the system in some classical way. We are saying, I want to perform measurements X and Y, and then I'm recording uh, these classical outcomes A's and B's, and, and then, then computing uh, this probability by repeating this many times. And from that, from this classical interaction, I'm trying to extract kind of the underlying quantum mechanical description of what's going, what is this system doing, right? Like, what is this vector and what are these um, uh, PLBM elements, these matrices? Okay. Uh, so this could be referred uh, as a self-testing from a correlation. So, Sorry, so you are, yeah. can I ask a question? So you are like repeating these measurements on the same state always, yes? So you have like many copies of this state psi? Yes, so uh, how, how does that, like there's like to, to deploy kind of this, this thing in, in some real world scenario, you would have to have additional things done like sort of your your assumption would be yes that you you're repeating the same uh that every time you you perform measurement x it's the same measurement that is being applied okay and to to ensure that this is actually the case you need to put yet another layer on when when you want to when, when you want to do it in a real world setting, okay? But I'm not gonna focus on that because it's kind of just additional layer that you would need to slap on on any of these self-testing states. Okay. Does that? Yeah, it's clear. It's just, uh, you are hiding something and it's uh, perfectly okay. Yeah, so this is kind of usually like when you talk about proving a self-testing theorem, you would not bother about it because that's somehow a separate thing that one would need to take care of and that would be common to like all self-testing results that need to be added on top of it. Uh, sorry, but can I have like a general question? So are there some ways to so to like certi well, certify to some extent this, this IID assumption, uh, like I know using some definitive theorems or yeah, like I, I, I'm not following this this field, so like, I, like, do pe people seriously bother about it or or not? In I mean, I mean, if you want to like run this as a protocol on actual devices, you have to take care of it somehow, right? But maybe kind of some very intuitive idea would be, well, if I can prove right that somehow, well, the only way to to reach some winning probability or to, to get some correlation p is with some specific state say right and now i run this many times and i see that i'm getting some p that is close to what what i think should be well i cannot guarantee that in every run of my experiment really this psi was used but it must have been that in large number of these experiments it was that psi or a state close to that psi that was being used right so that's kind of the intuitive idea uh gotcha but was it uh okay mm, okay but was it somehow uh, in some papers is it quantified somehow uh was this ad i guess it's addressed this is issue yeah you like okay. so for, for instance when you like if you look at this uh delft experiment right uh for uh chsh right mm -hmm. they, they need to take care of that uh gotcha uh thanks okay all right um all right so this was kind of the self-testing from this correlation so where i know all of these numbers all of these probabilities pab given x1 uh but one could con also consider uh and this is how maybe originally it was even done uh where you do this self-testing or certification task from a single number only that would be somehow some function of 
XP. Okay. Um, so, so to give you an example uh, in terms of uh, this CHS edge gain, right? So maybe in in that case, uh, these I just have two measurements and I on Alice and two on Bob. We choose to index index them with bits, so zero or one, and these measurements are two outcome, so zero or one outcomes as well. And then what we want to do is we want to ask, we want to try to satisfy this condition so that the XOR of the measurement outcomes is equal to the product of the measurement settings, okay? And um, well, even using quantum states and measurements, we cannot always satisfy so we cannot satisfy this uh, condition 100% of the time. So we think that we pick these x's and y's say, uniformly at random, but there's some highest probability with which we can satisfy this condition, okay? And I could say that this is optimal strategy for this CHSH again, because it satisfies the CHSH condition as often as possible quantumly. Okay, so uh, then in this context, a self, an informal self-testing statement would say, well, the Essentially, there's just one way to play this CHSH game optimally to reach this highest possible winning probability. And that is by sharing a specific quantum state, in this case, this 0, 0 plus 1, 1 state, and performing specific measurements. So it would be a measurement in X and Z basis uh, for Alice and measurement in these rotating basis for Bob. Okay. Um, and now, okay, it, there, there's one problem with these two statements that I've shown you that perhaps already came up uh, and I think, I don't know who asked that question about uh, how I'm getting this uh, uh, P in, in real world setting. Okay, so these, self, these informal self-testing statements, they actually have no practical significance, the ones I've given here. And the reason for it is that they have no uh, noise tolerance, right? So I'm never gonna, uh, so if I think say about the CHSH, right? If I try to do this with real world devices, any device that one builds will have some error in it. So I will never observe optimal success probability in CHSH. That's one source of error. Another source of error is that I actually don't know what correlation these devices are, um, are producing. I can only estimate it by collecting more and more samples, kind of getting closer and closer to this true success probability or true correlation that my devices have, but I can never get there exactly. So we have two, these two sources of error, and therefore what we want is kind of a robust self-testing statement in the case of CHSH, it would say that not only to play CHSH game optimally, I need this specific quantum state and measurements, but even just to replay it near optimally. So to be within epsilon of this optimal success probability, I need to perform measurements on a state that is close to this ideal state. And these measurements are close to these ideal measurements. Okay, so this is kind of the robust version of these statements. Okay, now uh, there's yet another thing I need to address and, and that is this word essentially. So in all of these statements I gave you, I said, well, there is essentially just one way. And what do I mean with this essentially? Okay, so it's not true that there is just real, literally just one state and one set of measurements that will produce this correlation or achieve um, this winning probability. So let's think about it. So if I have a setting like this, so I have some measurements that Alice performs, some measurements that Bob performs on some shared state. Okay, so I could describe these actions as this triple, this shared state psi tilde, and then these measurements on Alice given by these um, matrices A tilde and same for Bob's and B tildes. And then these probabilities that I talked about uh, uh, they would be given, I mean, I can compute them using Born's rule, right? Like if I measure a specific state, then with these measurements, what's the probability that I get specific out? Okay. All right, so now if 
if there is some way I can change this S tilde without changing P tilde, then that means that there is no way that I can distinguish between this S tilde and this changed S tilde because all I have access to is this correlation P. All I see is, are these probabilities, right? That's where, what I'm certifying from. That's the data I have available. So if data is not changing, of course, my, my conclusion is not gonna change. So then there are some two like very easy ways that come to mind of how we could change this strategy as tilde without changing P tilde. The first one is by just changing some basis, right? So I change the basis on my state and also on my measurements. Okay, so if you plug things in, uh, you will essentially have appearing this U star U and B star V appearing, right? So that's identities. It's going to be equal. These probabilities will be the same as for this strategy as still then. Okay, so we cannot see this local change of basis. Another thing I could be doing is that in addition to sharing this uh, state psi tilde, we also have some additional state on which Alice and Bob are doing nothing. And so mathematically, I'm just saying I, I do identity in this auxiliary system, okay? So that will also have no effect on, on these correlation probabilities. Okay, so I have no way of kind of discerning this local change of basis and also this presence of ancillary. So this is what we should keep in mind as I'm gonna show you now the formal definition of self-testing finally. Okay, so we start with two quantum strategies. I'm gonna think of this, these tilde strategies as some, as consisting of states and measurements that I'm looking to certify. And this other strategy S, so again, some state and some measurements, this is gonna be some arbitrary strategy. Okay, and then I'm gonna say that S tilde is a local dilation of S, so I'm introducing some relation on two strategies. I'm gonna denote it in this way to show that there's a directionality to this relation. Okay, if I can find this local isometry U, ten, uh, sorry, U uh, on, on Alice and V on, on Bob, such that uh, the state psi is being mapped to this canonical or reference state psi tilde tensor some ancillary state. But not only that, but also if I think about these post measurement states, right? These, when I apply the measurement on state psi, then this local isometry U tensor V, it maps uh, the post measurement states from the strategy S to those of this reference tilde strategy. Again, tensor the same auxiliary state, okay. Then I say that correlation P tilde self-tests or certifies this strategy S tilde, so this shared state and measurement. If whenever I have some other strategy S that induces the same correlation P tilde, then um, S can be locally dilated to S tilde. So informally, we're saying that essentially there's just one way, but we need to take care of these transformations that I showed you on the previous slide that, that are not reflected in this correlation. And that's what uh, this uh, local dilation uh, relation takes care of. Okay. Laura, can I have a question about yes. assumption? So it seems to me that you assume that the state is pure, no? Yes. So in principle, you can do that because the well, the hyperspace is un, well undefined. So, I mean, you can purify the state, no? But in principle, in, prin in principle, this 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 is assumption, and I, I this is how it's done okay. <laughs> normally. Uh, but in my opinion, one does would need to take uh, would need to take care of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Depending on your on your application, like again, in some applications, it might be fine uh, to make this assumption. Um, so, uh, right by just saying, well, um, if if I have a state, um, I can think of it of it as a pure state in some larger system. Okay. Um, so, can I also ask you? You defined, uh, let's say, the, uh, yeah, the, uh, yeah, the, those equivalent equivalent states that 
or strategies that give the same correlations via, let's say, those local isometries. But also there is, I think, one. Sorry, my uh, microphone stopped oh. working for a second. Sorry, it's my my fault. Uh, so uh, because it's low battery. Um, so, but there is one more isometry that locally, I mean, isometry, symmetry of quantum mechanics that you can apply, namely like transposition, right? So, uh, in, in principle, you like this is something you, you should also kind of take into account, right? Uh, right. So, I mean, in principle, there could, and, but probably there is like even a very large class of transformations that then would not be reflected. Uh, in this p tilde, it, especially also if you maybe you are using like you have some specific s tilde in mind, right? You you write this transposition is something that that ha has appeared as one of such transformations, but I mean you could potentially think of additional ones. I I see no reason why this should be an exhaustive list, and kind of where this goes in, and I. I think in general, I tend to agree. There's this question, we have this mathematical definition and then there's some philosophical concept that I was trying to explain in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's a fully justified question to ask to what extent this mathematical definition kind of accurately reflects the philosophy behind mm -hmm. self-testing. And um, I, I don't know whether that, I wouldn't say that we are at the end of and at the end of line there, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, th there is why I singled out transposition as like, as you probably know, like in like there is this theorem in quant sort of basically unitaries or like isometries and anti-unitaries or that you realize via partial transposition, they are somehow, they exhaust in some sense symmetries in quantum mechanics, right? That you have like on, on of the Born rule in a sense, right? Uh, maybe I'm, yeah. Okay, but I, I guess, I, I don't know, like I would, uh, we're now going kind of a little bit into, okay. into, into philosophy, which is fine, like, um, I guess, let's say with transposition, right, then you would say, oh, maybe you're not certifying some specific S tilde, but you're saying, oh, it could be this S tilde, mm -hmm. or it could be S tilde with transposition somewhere mm -hmm. uh, applied inside. And I think my stance in general would be, I would be happy calling something a self-testing statement as soon as you cert certify certain property of, mm -hmm. of whatever these quantum devices are doing. Kind mm -hmm. of the strongest thing you might want to certify, right? Is well, specific specific things, sp specific mm -hmm. quantum states and specific measurements without any transpositions added, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe because yeah. um, like if you take the transpose of these uh, things involved in a still that they don't change themselves, right? But you might want to certify something much weaker. So there's kind of, in, in my view, that you could talk about the spectrum of, of self-testing yeah. statements. I'm just going with the most strict sure, one. Sure. Um, yeah, all right. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, but there, there are definitely questions. I think one very legitimate questions one can ask about this uh, definition. Um, yes. Okay. Um, Maybe I just want to make a few small notes here uh, to kind of familiarize uh, ourselves a little bit more with this uh, perhaps daunting looking definition if you had, haven't seen it before. So um, the first thing I want to say is that you can actually notice that as stated, this condition one is superfluous because if I have condition two, right, for all A, B, X, Y, what I could do is I could fix X and Y and I could take a sum over A and B. Right? And then as I'm summing this over A and B, because these are measurements for fixed X and Y, then you would get identity here, right? Everywhere. And you would recover this equation one. So this condition two actually implies one. Um, the reason why I'm giving both of them is that sometimes people are interested in only certifying um, the state and not the measurements. So then they would just focus on proving this first equation without this second one. Yes. Second one, I would say I'm certifying measurements as well. Uh, yes, and then there is some kind of physical interpretation we could think about this. 
isometry, right? You could kind of ask on which side do I need to apply this isometry? Um, but uh, what, what if I think, um, if I'm applying it, it on this left-hand side on this unknown strategy S, then what I'm saying is that if I have these, um, these measurement uh, and, and state generation devices, and I could think by, that by performing some uh, kind of local uh, physical process that would then implement this, this local unit through U and V, I can transform them to this, um, this canonical or ideal strategy I have in mind, this tilde. Okay, but now this was just uh, this uh, definition of self-testing. Uh, see, it again does not have any noise tolerance. And as I mentioned in practical scenarios, we care about these robust statements. So what do you do is you just insert epsilons essentially everywhere, okay? So then you would want to say that uh, one, uh, that uh, the strategy S tilde is a local epsilon dilation. So you take the same equations as before and you say that they hold up to epsilon, okay? So these are vectors, right? Uh, so you could uh, just look at the two norm um, of their difference. And you say that uh, these vectors need to be epsilon close in two norm. And then we would say that the correlation P tilde robustly self-test S tilde. If for any epsilon, you can find a delta such that whenever your observations are delta close to the ideal ones, you can guarantee that your strategy uh, is um, local, uh, that can be uh, locally epsilon dilated to this canonical strategy. Okay, so we have these two parameters, epsilon and delta, okay? Uh, so uh, kind of this delta uh, tells you how close your observations have to be in order to guarantee closeness uh, of, uh, of what your devices are doing to this uh, specification, okay? And, and the way I phrased it here is, uh, is kind of existential. I'm saying that for every desired closeness of the strategy, right, of these devices to ideal behavior, um, there exists a delta, okay? And um, again, for practical applications, you actually, you would want a more explicit dependence between these two parameters, epsilon and delta. For instance, maybe you want that delta is some simple function uh, of epsilon. And we know that there are several kind of, there are different communities of people working uh, on self-testing and they usually care about proving different types of statements. So um, say uh, people coming more from computer science, they would not care about the specific constant C here, the specific form of this F, where they say, oh, it's polynomial or something and, and, and they're happy. Uh, but uh, if you wanted to go to an actual experiment and apply it, then people really care to optimize what this constant C is and find the best constant C and the best form of this F, okay? So people are working in, in different regimes. Laura, can I have a question? Yeah. So, uh, well, whenever I, I well, work with self-testing, it seems that the referees are always concerned about this like robustness statement. So what you, what you have introduced is a kind of continuity, no? I mean, if I deviate a bit from the I don't know, maximal violation of my bed inequality, then I can prove that the state that gives this violation is close to the ideal state. But do you know any, do you know any self-testing statement which is not continuous in this sense? Um, Could it be that- but why, I mean, why, why do you think, so, so, so I don't see is, continu okay. continuity in this statement really, but maybe I'm missing something you're saying. I'm just saying that, um, you should be able to take epsilon to zero by taking delta to zero. Mm -hmm. That's what this is saying, right? Yes. Yeah, I guess Emic was referring to this kind of because this definition has this favor for every epsilon, there exists a delta, right? So, yes. so in that sense, it's a continuity. You don't control how, like, uh, you know, you don't control the dependence of delta on epsilon, right? This is kind of the weakest form, I would yeah. say, one would. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. But my point is that uh, do we know? So, is it possible that, for instance, if I prove uh, my self testing statement, like exact self testing statement without yeah. these deltas and epsilons, 
uh, is it possible that there exists a, a self-testing statement for which I couldn't prove this uh, robustness statement? I think this is really cool. Like, I'm interested in this question. I don't think we have such an example. Exactly. So whenever... I, I believe, yeah, okay. but I believe that such an example should exist. Really? Yes. Okay. So, uh, okay, I'm, we can maybe talk about it uh, yeah, sure. uh, a little more later. Like, um, I'm kind of, I realize I'm going uh, slow, but that is completely fine. Um, like, I'm going to say how actually we can see this self-testing as being related to representation theory or uh, stability of algebraic relations. And people have studied this question in the now, in the context of like, I don't know, what would be the area? Operator algebras. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and there they have these examples of these non-stable uh, relations. Where, where, where you can have a sequence of things that, that kind of satisfy some relation better and better, but are nevertheless, you cannot identify them as being close to uh, some, some fixed one. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yes. So, so that was kind of uh, just to, all I've done so far, <laughs> is it told you what self-testing is and, and kind of tried to give you some intuition about these formal definitions. Now, we could ask some sort of efficiency statement about these self-tests, right? So suppose that the state that we want to certify, right, it has uh, some dimension D. We might want to ask, well, how many measurements? Let, let's say we just now focus on self-testing of states, right? I just want to certify these um, state generation boxes. How many measurements will I need um, with how many outcomes to certify a d-dimensional state? Will this number have to depend on d? And if so, in what manner, right? Uh, and, and the idea here is that somehow, uh, right? So, so, so the dimension somehow is, is, is exponential, say, in, if, you, if you think about the number of qubits, right? And then, if you needed to do some exponential effort to certify n qubits, then maybe it's not realistic to, to carry out this certification process. Right? All right. So what do we know, right, in terms of this uh, um, self-testing and, and efficiency of self-testing? Well, we know how to uh, self-test measurements in small dimensions. Uh, we know... Uh, Oh, okay, and, and when it comes to sort of self-testing of measurements versus states, self-testing of states is much better understood than self-testing of measurements. Okay? And in the context of states, in particular, we have this very nice theorem that says that every pure entangled bipartite state can be self-tested. Okay? So every state that in this bipartite setting that you might hope to self-test can indeed be self-tested. Okay, and in this scheme that is presented in this work, you need three me measurement outcomes to certify state of uh, dimension D, but the number of uh, outcomes in these schemes grow with the dimension. Okay. So if you thought of like number of qubits or something, then this would be exponential. Right? So now if we, rather than trying to uh, self-test uh, arbitrary state, but we look at some specific classes of states, then we know that we can do things more efficiently. So for instance, uh, maximally entangled states, we can uh, self-test with uh, efficiently. So with a logarithmic number uh, of questions and answers, logarithmic um, in the dimension. Uh, sorry, Laura, I have a question about like uh, this efficiency. So uh, I guess just number of outcomes, uh, okay, it doesn't tell you about like efficiency yet, right? You have to probably, like what probably matters is the sampling, I don't know, sampling complexity of uh, correlation uh, of, let's say, learning probability distributions or this behavior, right? Uh, so it might be that actually, you know, the, uh, you have some just probability is concentration in concert is concentrated on, on small number of outcomes and then effectively even though the number of outcomes is exponential with the system size you can still efficiently let's say estimate this probability distribution right so so, so i think it, it depends where your 
um, what you are self-testing from. So if you're self-testing from correlation, it, then it somehow says that, uh, well, depending on the specific, how the statement is phrased also, but you might need to estimate all of these correlation probabilities up to certain. I see. And now these okay. correlation probabilities, right? They scale polynomially in the number of questions and answers. If you're self-testing just from uh, gain value or bell violation, maybe you, then you might not have that issue. However, you will still need to build this device with exponentially mm -hmm. many um, uh, kind of measurement outcomes. And there is some exponential effort sort of involved into just, just make, ha having that device, you know? Like, right. I mean, okay, maybe it's it's hard to implement such a measurement, but in principle, computation. I mean, I know that you you don't use computational basis measurements to to do the self testing, but just computational basis measurement has exponentially many outcomes to begin with, right? In a sense. Yes. Right. Yes. So then. Okay, you're okay. saying oh, it's just uh, it could could be single qubit measurements that then you combine somehow that these measurements yeah. are built out of kind of uh, just polynomially many single system, like kind of smaller measurement. Yeah, okay, I just, for efficiency, okay, like if one, I, I just wonder if the number of outcomes is the right, always right measure of uh, like efficiency, because probably the, uh, rather the complexity of unitaries that you need to implement to pull off those measurements would be the, like, the appropriate. Like more appropriate. Yes, method. there there could be like kind of kind of some higher level concerns. Like here, I guess I'm I'm asking for both. Like I'm asking mm -hmm. uh, these uh, both number of measurements and um, and the uh, and sure. uh, questions as well. Sure. You you might yeah you you might introduce additional uh, things as well. If, but if you are self testing from correlation, which like this work is self-testing from correlation. So then, um, I mean, you need to estimate those numbers and there will be exponentially many of them. I, I don't know. Uh, yep, thanks. Um, okay. In general, we have these uh, kind of um, not so efficient schemes, but then if you look at more specialized classes of measurements, then you know that you can do things more efficiently. And what actually, and, and in my opinion, surprisingly, what was shown by Hong Hao Fu is that actually you can self-test arbitrarily large states using constant size correlations. Okay, so constant number of measurement settings and outcomes. Okay, this is not something that allows you to self-test an arbitrary state, but shows you um, that for uh, an infinite family of maximally entangled states, so growing dimension, you can self-test them from fixed size correlations. Now, uh, the kind of uh, downside of this result is that it's a pretty complicated scheme. Uh, we try to count exactly how many questions it has. We arrived at the number something around 100. So this tells you like that uh, maybe if we did a more careful analysis, we could get a more nicer, uh, like more precise number, but it, the scheme is relatively involved, right? So that it's not obvious uh, from the outset, like even how many questions for it it's gonna have. Okay, so in a way we uh, give a similar uh, type of result. So we also show self-testing of arbitrarily large uh, states um, uh, with con from constant size correlations. Um, the advantage of our scheme over Hong Hao scheme is that um, the scheme is simpler. Uh, for instance, it just uses four, two outcome measurements, and it also self-tests uh, measurements, not just quantum states. Okay, um, our result also has downsides as compared to Hong Hao's result, and our downside has to do with robustness. We don't have kind of an explicit robustness statement. Our statement is rather than for every epsilon there exists delta. Now I'll try to point out where this kind of non-constructive part comes from. Okay, and maybe before I go to more concretely stating the result, it's good 
place to mention that while originally the self-testing was, was really um, um, used as this tool for, or, or it was motivated as, as means of certifying um, functionality of uh, untrusted quantum devices or uncharacterized quantum devices, um, it's increasingly self-testing has been used as a proof ingredient for proving other types of results. Okay? Um, like maybe one very nice example is uh, this recent breakthrough result of uh, RE equals NIP star, right? Um, these two uh, quantum correlation sets, uh, their self-testing appears as a proof ingredient. Okay. So, um, uh, in the second part, what I wanted to do is to tell you more about what the result, our result uh, actually says and, uh, and the ideas that we use to obtain it. Okay, so the, our result is that we can, that it suffices to use constant number of measurement settings um, and measurement outcomes to self-test certain families of quantum states and measurements. And in particular, four, uh, two outcome measurements is enough. So what we do is we essentially prove a family of self-testing statements. So we construct some correlations P tilde and our P tildes will, have, will be indexed by two parameters. One is N uh, and another one is X. So for every N there will be an infinite family of Xs. So N is gonna correspond to the number of measurement um, settings. Okay, uh, and uh, these correlations will be self-tests for maximally entangled states in uh, various dimensions. Okay, how do we get these correlations? We start with projections. So we take N projections uh, that add up to constant times identity, okay? So maybe one nice example of this is if I take n unit vectors uh, in dimension n minus one, and I kind of place them out, uh, space them out as symmetrically as possible. So they form a regular n simplex. So like in, uh, for n equals three, it would be this Mercedes sign, okay, this, these trine states. Okay? Now, if I look at the projections given by these vectors, so projections onto these vectors, and I add them all up, well, because they are so symmetrically placed, you get identity and the constant, this X is gonna be equal to N over N minus one. This is just one example, okay? And in particular, it's non-trivial to say, like if you pick some N, some specific N and some specific X, sometimes such projections don't exist, simply, okay? So in principle, it's a question, okay? For what pairs N X, can you find such projections? Um, sorry, can I just, yeah. uh, so th those are just uh, projections in a sense that they are like projections onto one dimensional subspaces of the Hubert space, rank one projectors uh, or- In, the, in this example, they are rank one. In general, ah, heat, okay. they would not be rank one. I see, I see. Because if, if they were rank one, then you at least know like if they, if you have some number, then you know X otherwise. Uh, in a given dimension. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So like maybe one very easy restriction on X's that you can get here is if you tra trace kind of on both sides, right? Uh, then, then you see that, well, this X will need to be rational number. Uh, sure, sure. I had in mind something exactly like that. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But, but in principle, it's a hard question to say for what n's and x's will these p's exist, okay? And uh, luckily for us, like uh, someone else has done the hard work, so we're building on it. So in this paper, um, there's a paper by Krugler, Rabanovich, and Samoylenko, where for every n and greater or equal to three, they identify the set of x's such that this equation has a solution. Okay, so that you can find these projections. 
Um, can I ask? So, do they assume f fixed dimension, uh, or like you, you like that you can adjust the dimension somehow? Of, uh, yeah. Yeah, you don't fix the dimension. You just say mm -hmm. in some dimension they exist, and and these right. are, I think, I don't know what precise area, but they talk also about like uh, infinite dimensional spaces uh, and so mm -hmm. on as well. But what we care about is like where really you can do this in finite dimensions. Right. I, I have one organizational question because in principle. Uh, like in roughly 10 minutes or so we should uh, finish, although we are probably quite interested in the technical aspects of what you are going to say. So I, what would be the proxy, like 20, 20 minutes, would it be enough for you to fill or you need a bit yeah, more time? I mean, I can, uh, like I can finish uh, in time, but I just <laughs> of course in the, in the pre Okay. So let's be relaxed a bit. Uh, yeah, but let's have in mind. Yeah, maybe let's not go above, let's say, 25 minutes from now. Yeah, okay? how, how about this? I'm just going to aim to finish very soon. And then we can stop the recording and everything. And we can, I can show you slowly the more technical details for people who are interested. And everyone else is fine. I mean, we tend to, anyway, like, let's say 25 minutes from, from now. And then we do maybe as you propose. Yeah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. <laughs> All right. OK. So they, so uh, these authors, they do the hard work. And they find uh, these n's and x's, OK, for the, which this equation has a solution. And they actually go one step further and they analyze the sort of representation theory and they ask, okay, like what degree of freedom do I have here if I have one solution of, uh, for particular ends and axes? Um, are there, is there more than one non-equivalent non solution? Okay. So they identify this subset, lambda sub, sub n, where this choice of P's, so because we, we are within this gamma set, uh, we know that there is some solution to this uh, equation, but moreover, this lambda uh, sub n set is very nice. And it means that there's essentially just one solution. And what it means that, well, any other solution uh, can be obtained by tensoring with identity and applying some unit trees. Kind of in the representation theoretic sense, there's a unique irreducible representation of uh, for for this for these pairs n x that are in the set lambda n for, or for x's that are in the set lambda n. Okay, so that is what we focus on. We only look at at pairs n x that are kind of uh, captured in this collection of these sets lambda. N. Yeah, so in, in some basis that, uh, that tells us that this PI has to be this one irreducible PI tensor identity. Okay, now these are projections, right? We need to get to correlations. How do we do it? Uh, well, we just take maximally entangled state. We, we look at this irreducible representation uh, with these P tildes. And we look at the maximally entangled state in the dimension of this irreducible representation. And to get a measurement from these n projections, we simply take each of the projections and identity minus that projection, right? That gives us a two outcome measurement, n two outcome measurements specifically. So Alice does those measurements and then Bob does the transpose of those measurements. Okay. And then we give this name P tilde sub NX for the correlations that are then induced uh, by this strategy S tilde NX. Okay, so for, for every N greater or equal to three and every X in the set lambda N, and uh, these sets lambda N, all of them are infinite uh, once N is at least four. Okay, so, so we get, we're gonna get kind of infinitely many self-tests. And informally, uh, our statement says that any quantum uh, strategy that induces uh, correlation P that is close to this P tilde NX, this strategy S needs to be close to this canonical strategy S tilde. Okay, and then here is the statement kind of written out using this 
definition of self-testing. Um, can I ask, so uh, can you give more intuition how this uh, lambda n set, so how this lambda n set looks like and like what are the dimensions, like do you get all the dimensions, mm -hmm. like how this x uh, sort of behaves, etc. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. So in, in general, uh, the construction that, uh, so we're using this construction from this, uh, this paper uh, I mentioned. Mm -hmm. And in general, the construction is recursive. So it's somehow, um, so this lambda n set is, it has some ordering and you kind of, uh, you construct every next x from the previous one using some formula. We don't know a closed form expression for general n's, but we, but in the case that n is equal to four, uh, we can kind of get all odd dimensions, it turns out. I see. Mm. Right, and okay, it's, uh, right, right. So, okay, uh, I guess I would need to look on that paper specifically because it's sort of, yeah, it's an interesting identity uh, that, mm -hmm. that they satisfy, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, but kind of to, to answer, like, in general, like, uh, yeah, we don't have this closed form uh, construction for these x's, um, but kind of to get our result, we, we, we prove this self-testing statement for, for all n and for all x's in these set lambda n, and then we only use it for n equals. Sure. So, uh, but, okay, but then... Uh... Wait, if I understand, so you have uh, so you have different x for different d, if I understand, right? Uh, mm, mm, okay, maybe let me do this. Uh, okay, I mean, you can please go. I do, didn't want no, no, to. Uh, no, yeah. I think I think actually this this might be uh, this might be good. Uh, okay, so here's this informal statement, right? Uh, that that you just saw, and mm -hmm. now what we do is we focus on the case that n is equal to four. Mm -hmm. In that case, we know that this set lambda four, we can, this recursive formula is simple. Mm -hmm. and, and we can say that this set lambda four, it contains all these numbers, four k over two to the k plus one. And that this strategy, so these projectors, um, that again come from this paper, the dimension is equal to uh, to the denominator in this fraction. So if, if, you, mm -hmm. if you assume it's uh, reduced, right? So it has no common divisors, the top and mm -hmm. the bottom. Then the dimension is given by, by the bottom uh, number. And in this case, it's 2k plus 1. Right? So this gives you all odd dimensions. So these correlations, mm -hmm. they will have four questions, two answers, but the states that they will self-test will be in dimension 2k plus 1 mm -hmm. for every k. Uh, gotcha. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the same for measurements. Uh, so what then, about even dimensions? Um, so we think that you can actually, you, using the, like, again, these correlations that you can also get even ones, but we don't have, we haven't, mm -hmm. we haven't, we sure. So I didn't case. want to disturb your presentation. Just uh, I'm interested. No, I, yeah. I, I think uh, so. In fact, I, I think this this might be a natural kind of stopping point. So what I've told you is I haven't gone into proof details, but I've told you what the result is, and then kind of how to get um, this corollary, right? That we can use uh, constant size correlations to certify arbitrary large states and measurements. And by large measurements, you mean measurements acting on large dimensional space? On large dimensions. And actually, uh, they are, I mean, because there are only four of them, you can also see that the rank of these measurements grows, uh, sure. which also we don't have many examples where uh, measurements of higher 
where measurements beyond basis measurements are being self-tested, right? So where your sure. measurements have some higher rank. Um, and, and here mm -hmm. you have self-testing of measurements of arbitrarily high rank. Okay. Mm. Thanks. All right. I think, I think I'm gonna stop here uh, the, the, formal, uh, the formal part. So what I've done, right? I've uh, explained you this idea of self-testing and then I've showed you that surprisingly, in my opinion, you can self-test these states in very large dimensions, specific states. We don't know how to do it for an arbitrary state with fixed number of measurement outcomes and settings. All right, thank you guys. Thank you, Laura. Uh, so do you have any questions? Does anyone have uh, any questions? If not, then I have some questions. <laughs> so look, because it seems that, so these projections, uh, so it might be that they form some P of EM, no? this P1 to PN. Um, well, this, this X is not gonna be one. Yeah, but this X you can somehow move to the other side of this uh, of this equation, no? And then you have like measurement operators of some P of EM. Yes. Yeah. So could it be that, like, so? Well, I understand that from this uh, PIs you construct binary measurements, okay, mm -hmm. projective measurements. But in some sense, you also certify. A, uh, it could be that in some sense you also certify a P of EM composed of these PIs. Um. So kind of like operationally thinking, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the measurement that you're doing, right? Because this correlation, if you look at the, what is contained in this correlation. Yes. I, I mean, somehow imagine you have some boxes, right? That, that do, do two outcome measurements. You have some P0, P1, and then Q0, Q1. Mm -hmm. How would I do a measurement that's P0, Q0, right? That has operators, P0, Q, like just physically, like how, how would I do this? Well, I don't understand what you want to say. So, so I, I, I just mean that, that phys physically kind of what, what is there in the correlation are- Well, I kind of understand that you perform many measurements that are binary, but- I mean, in the end, you certify those operators. And in some sense, you, you, you can say that they form, a, because you know, you know it no? from the assumption. I mean, they have to sum up to the identity. So yes. you know that they form a, a POVM. So it's uh, maybe an indirect way of certifying this POVM. Maybe, maybe you could think of it as in indirect way, way indeed. But like, kind of in, like, I would say that if I want a POVM that's, uh, that has these operators, that there should be a box. Sure, sure, sure. No, I understand. In a state. Sure, but uh, also, okay. Mm -hmm. Indirectly, maybe, or if I had some way that out of these binary boxes, I could build out this N, N box, right? Mm -hmm. then, then I guess I would also be happy to. Uh, so, just can I comment if I just uh, add this? So, so, I guess you, I mean, we didn't go into proof techniques, uh, but you sort of uh, on the you, you have this relation that involves the projectors and this, let's say, multiple of identity. Uh, and then from, from those, you construct, let's say, from those projectors, you construct binary measurements corresponding to them. And this is probably like uh, one way, but I, I agree with Remick that like subject to some uniqueness, uh, I mean, you like mathematics gives us like uniqueness of those relations up, up to this uh, isometry in a sense, right? So. Mm -hmm. You can, I mean, uh, I, I guess the broader question probably would be like, can one use this result when n, for example, when n is such that it's larger than the dimension of the space in which those guys are represented irreducibly, right? Because then, you know, by just uh, multiplying by this inverse of this x, you'll like in the left, you have just some p of vm with and effects right that adapt to identity right uh, and i think it's it's a pretty cool question uh yeah I mean, I... so uh 
I don't know if this is uh, kind of answering it, uh, the question or not, but so we need right some kind of uh, setup, physical setup, right? All that we have access to is some sort of probabilities. And we need to say, if something is to produce these probabilities, then I need that the underlying operator satisfy this equation. And I need to have some way of enforcing it. And somehow the, the probabilities that we use, you mean someone, yeah, it, it's just not clear to me whether, uh, whether just having uh, like an N outcome P of M would, uh, would, would be enough. No, so so I guess I mean just by measuring one one measurement, you can you cannot in this setting uh, certify. I mean you have a local model when you when every party has right. a uh, has a single P of M, right? But like maybe on the kind of on the top of doing what you are doing, if you kind of adapt, you know. Uh, but can, can yeah, we, yeah, I guess yeah. you could. Add, yeah, I, I think you could do that actually. Yes, you could do this plus something, and then requires some sort of consistency that then would guarantee that this new mm. measurement that you introduced is this n outcome p of n mm. maybe right so just can we okay i mean sorry Rebecca, i bumped in into your question <laughs> Uh, if you have a question, you can ask it now. <laughs> no, I mean, I would be interested in in those technical details, like of the okay. proof. But uh, yeah. So maybe oh. another question would be that. Uh, so it's in, so this is like for maximally entangled states. Uh, and have you tried with like partially entangled states? Um, no, <laughs> it's the short answer. And uh, so, look, like we are, we are relying somehow on someone else having proved this not, and analyzed the representation theory of this relation. So, so somehow, I don't know. Like also the the nice, maybe the message that I would like to convey with this is somehow that we could try in general in self testing exploit this link to representation theory, because if in a way you think that whenever you prove a self-testing statement, you're trying to uh, like classify irreducible representations of some object, group, algebra, whatever. We know that it's hard work, right? It took mathematicians so long to kind of pin down these uh, representations. It was years and years of many, many people. So that, I guess my idea is, well, we should try to build on that hard work someone else has done, right? Yeah, true, true. But I was thinking of like a steering scenario in which you can assume that one of the parties has a trusted me measuring device and performs some like fixed measurements. So maybe you could use exactly the same techniques to find some self-testing statements for the for partially entangled states. Because now like you have these binary measurements only on one side, and on the mm -hmm. other side you have something fixed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's a good idea. We have not okay. uh, looked at all. Like kind of actually the thing we want to address now is is this robustness like um, uh, that we're not happy with this non-constructive robustness that our result has okay. uh, and and what we need to prove there is some kind of uh, some statement about irreducible representations of algebras like about some stability of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, can I so, ask? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just can. Uh, can I ask, uh, just following on this previous question that I had, so like, uh, so if I end this, sorry, just looking on this lambda four here, like uh, you get somehow, so except maybe for one case, the, the dimensions in which, uh, let's say, uh, you get, uh, yeah, like dimensions in which you have representations, right? They are larger than the, they're like, it's much larger than four, right? Uh, I mean, so my question is like, do, uh, does it happen sometimes that, uh, I mean, well, can, can you also, I mean, do, do you have some handle like, you know, when I, that N would be actually larger than the dimension in which you represent uh, the, 
uh, irreducibly uh, those relations. Or some examples of that. Well, I guess like this uh, this example of this complex. So it's not much larger, but like this example of n simplex. It's just a different by one, but it it is larger. Mm -hmm. Right. So here you have n vectors, and they are in dimension n minus one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, gotcha. So something like that to say. Uh, but um, in, in general, like for for example, if I wanted to, so in general, I would be interested in arbitrary, possibly arbitrary, n from uh, d plus one to d squared, because like I'm interested in extreme POVMs, for example. So, mm -hmm. uh, like, can I find x such that I would, would have like unique sort of POVM with this property? Or? So, uh, I mean, um, I don't know. In general, like, I mean, I don't know. I don't have like a nice understanding of these pairs n x that we can have beyond. Uh, beyond this recursive formula that they give, mm -hmm. somehow uh, actually like so. So I said that for every n, you have this set lambda n, and this yeah. set is ordered. Um, and actually, the first element in this set will be this number always. Mm -hmm. And then the next I ones see. are obtained using some recursive procedure. And I, I don't know precisely. What denominators will you will you get there? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, so maybe following Michal's comment and my previous comment, so uh, I think it would be interesting to to see whether uh, in this way, in this in, in direct way, you can uh, certify a d square outcome p of n because this could be used for certification of randomness. Mm -hmm. Okay, so imagine that now by using your scheme, you can certify such a POVM. You could also certify that maximal randomness has been generated from the state. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is uh, uh, an open question, like for states of arbitrary dimension. Okay, yeah, we like, I think it's a nice question, but we really haven't, okay. we, we, we haven't thought about it. And as I said, somehow, I think, you now if you wanted to actually carry out this randomness, you would care that the self-testing statement is has no nice robustness properties, and what we have currently that does not. It's this existential statement for every epsilon. There is delta. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So we can move to the details now. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe let's let's finish kind of the official <laughs> okay. part.